Today, it's my pleasure to announce our speaker um, who will focus um, on the forefront of the third vaccine, vaccine rollout and give some insights from Israel. Professor Ran Balitzer, and most of you have seen him before on, on one of the Elnet events, across Europe and, and also in our whole network. Uh, we are very pleased to, to have you with us today. And we all know that while governments across the globe struggle to contain the spread of the COVID-19 Delta variant, Israel again uh, is in, in the leading position. It was the first country to approve the booster vaccination. And we have already learned, I don't want to uh, give too much spoiler uh, on, on your lecture, but we've already learned that since June, more than 30% of the eligible population has received a third shot. And some data already shows, and I'm sure you will comment on that on more detail, um, that um, there is a significantly higher immunity among this group. So while Elna deals with international relations and all of us are very much eager to be able to travel and meet again. Obviously, we, we also want to feel safe. And without further ado, I mean, your position as a leading expert, not only in Israel, but globally, but foremost as the uh, chair of the Israeli COVID-19 national experts team uh, is um, here again, much appreciated. We are looking forward to your introductory remarks for some 15, 20 minutes. And afterwards, we'll open the floor for a regular Q&A session for everyone here on today's call. So Ran, without further ado, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. It is truly a pleasure and a privilege to be speaking to you today once again. Um, um, I will try to shed some light on the recent events of the Delta surge in Israel um, and some of the scientific data that was accumulated during our work with data-driven assessment. Uh, so my name is Ron, I'm a physician, a public health physician by training, and I also serve as the Chief Innovation Officer of Khalid, which is the largest healthcare organization in Israel, serving over half of the population. And as was mentioned, I am the chair of the Israeli National Experts Panel on COVID-19 response. So as we all know, um, the pandemic always feels like you're in the fog of war. Until the point you feel like you have some clarity of where you are and what the situation is, a turn of events takes place and you once again feel like you have to reassess and recalculate where you are. And, and definitely uh, this is where we are standing right now. I just wanna remind us some of the uh, events that took place in the third wave uh, before we go into what's happening right now. So Israel had before three major surges. The third one was back in uh, uh, December, January and February of uh, 2021. And this was a dilemma that we had by the, uh, uh, towards the end of the third wave, whether we should open the very long lockdown despite the fact that the morbidity wasn't going down or not. Uh, we started our large vaccination campaign before any other country almost uh, uh, at uh, the 20th of December. And we didn't know whether it's working as well in real life as it did in clinical trials. So this is how we very rapidly vaccinated in the previous event. And we said, well, we don't know whether it works. This is the clinical trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed the vaccine is very effective, but we didn't know at that point whether it was or it was not. And we said, why don't we try to do a real world vaccine effectiveness study based on the data that we've accumulated at Clalit. And the problem is there are many, many uh, biases when one tries to infer uh, real causal uh, inference from retrospective data. Many challenges I will, will not go into today. I, I talked a little bit to it in our previous session uh, just a few months ago. So what we basically did is we took 600,000 vaccinees, and we coupled them with their digital twin, with someone that was nearly identical to them, but was not vaccinated. That person had to be in the same age and in the same, uh, living in the same vicinity. And I'll give you that example in a second. Let's remind ourselves what we did. So for every vaccinated individuals, we coupled them. For instance, if we had a 56 year old ultra orthodox male living in Tel Aviv, with three chronic diseases and two consecutive years of flu vaccination, we couple them with a 56 year old ultra orthodox male that lives in the same neighborhood in Tel Aviv, had three chronic diseases and two years of consecutive flu vaccination. So that was the level of, um, of, of matching that we have done in order to emulate what is called a target trial, to try to look as if this was a randomized controlled trial. 
So we did this. And wherever a unvaccinated twin got vaccinated, we had decoupled those couple, created a new pair for this newly vaccinated person and started following them until their twin got vaccinated. So you can imagine this involves a lot of uh, intensive computing in order to do this and some requires data that is almost unattainable anywhere else uh, uh, in terms of the, the level of intricacy of the clinical data. Um, and so this is what we've done. Um, we've been able to show on that, uh, this is the New England publication that we had back then, that indeed um, we were able to fully emulate a target trial. And you can see here on the first 12 days post vaccination, there was no effect, which shows that there was very little residual bias. So this is, you can see here, the team that worked on this from the Kalit Research Institute, uh, Professor Miguel Hernan, Professor Mark Lipschitz, Professor Ben Rice, some of the most important figures in, in global epidemiology and causal inference. And uh, this study group got into understanding that the vaccine was very effective, reduced, according to this, by 93% the um, um, overall infections. And we said, you know what, let's, we are going with this, we will open the lockdown and we will uh, uh, know that the vaccines will do the trick. And it did. Very rapidly afterwards, it did. So later on, we have proven in the clinical trial where we followed up on people and took active swabs from them, health, uh, and, and this is about to be published, um, and we've been able to show at that point in time that we were exact on the point in our assessment uh, as we did with real-world data, as we did in a trial with the, a specific follow-up in in, in the same country and in the same population. So this was the third wave basically. And then we kept on looking at different subgroups. In this case, for instance, pregnant women. And we've been able to show that the vaccine is exceedingly effective in reducing symptomatic infections in, uh, and severe infections in uh, pregnant women, which are by the way, a very high risk group that should be very much encouraged to get vaccinated. And so we've been able to show that. At that point in time came the second question, which was okay. The vaccine is very effective. Is it safe? And what we've done is that we took the same approach of careful matching of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, 850,000 individuals um, to their uh, exact matches of uh, unvaccinated uh, in individuals. And we compared what was recorded in several weeks of follow-up after vaccination in those that got and didn't get vaccinated. So this is not an assessment of the vaccine safety based on people reporting stuff to the Ministry of Health. This is not based on active reporting. This is what whatever they came with to their physician or if they had to go to an ER or if they got admitted, all of those diagnoses were recorded. We teased them out and we compared their incidents among those that were vaccinated and among those that were not vaccinated. And using this, we were able to show which adverse events were actually associated with uh, 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 vaccination and which were not. And what we see here is that um, basically you can see three, that's in the blue, uh, four adverse events were associated with the vaccination. One was uh, enlargement of lymph node, especially in the armpit, that could be expected. Zo herpes zoster, shingles there was uh, additional 16 cases per 100,000. Um, appendicitis was slightly raised with four, five cases per 100,000 and myocarditis. Remember that, we'll get to that in a second. So myocarditis was proven. And you can see here uh, also in the blue that myocarditis in the left, lower left corner, there was a higher likelihood of having myocarditis if you got vaccinated than if you were not. Okay, so this was not enough. What we did is do the same trick for people who did not get vaccinated, but got COVID-19. So we said, is any of these side effects happens among people who got COVID-19 and to what extent? What we were able to show is that first of all, many other uh, adverse events were happening in COVID-19 patients, but not in post-vaccination patients. So there's no, additional rate of heart attacks, of myocardial infarction, of arrhythmias, of, of, uh, of uh, kidney failure, of uh, brain hemorrhage, and additional other things that did not happen after the vaccination with the uh, Pfizer-BNT 
uh, 162B2 uh, vaccine, mRNA vaccine, but did occur in people who didn't get vaccinated, got COVID-19, and they had huge access of these uh, adverse events. They had much more acute kidney injury. Look, 125 per 100,000. They had many more arrhythmias. They had many more heart attacks. They had deep vein thrombosis. So this was very helpful in showing that what are the side effects of the vaccine, what are not, which is as important, but also to give clinical context of whether you want to choose to get the vaccine or you want to bet on getting COVID-19. And what would be worse in terms of these adverse events, put aside the direct impact of COVID-19 and the, your chances of getting a severe illness. So this is uh, another one from this study, also published in the New England Journal of Medicine and also with the same group of scholars that were involved in this. Now, we went then to do a follow-up study on vaccine safety on myocarditis, and we could see that the, many of the cases, most of the cases took place after the second dose rather than the first dose. And when we stratified this by age, we could show that while the overall risk of COVID-19 post-vaccination was two per 100,000, when you looked at young males between the age of 16 and 29, the rate was considerably uh, uh, higher. Um, and you can see this here with 10 per 100,000 cases. So it's higher, but it's still t only 10 per 1,000 cases. And more importantly, we followed up on these people for six weeks. And we tried and we opened their charts. Cardiologists opened their charts and to, to check the severity. And indeed, this was a, in vast majority of cases, very mild disease. In 75% a mild disease when they came to the hospital. And in additional, almost 23% as they left the hospital, there was one case of severe, what was called fulminant myocarditis. They eventually recovered, but he had the more severe uh, outcome. So um, even when you do have myocarditis because of uh, uh, um, vaccination, it is by and large um, a mild illness. Which brings us uh, to uh, the recent Delta wave. And what we saw was after we had a lull, after in June, we had nearly zero cases and we had two consecutive weeks of zero deaths from COVID-19, suddenly a new wave started. And it went exponentially for eight consecutive weeks from uh, an overall increased a hundred fold within those eight weeks. Why? Why did Israel see such a rapid, dramatic uh, uh, wave of illness after, if you consider the fact that at that point in time, it was one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. Well, first thing is here on blue, which is the introduction of Delta into Israel uh, by the late May and beginning of June, change transmission dynamics, Delta is much more infected. Um, still, I will just mention that <coughs> the Delta wave had uh, uh, um, considerably a uh, higher number of cases per million at its peak. But when you look at the overall admissions to the ICU, it was lower, which means both the residual uh, uh, immunity from uh, uh, the previous vaccination, as well as the booster campaign had reduced dramatically the rate of uh, a severe infection in, uh, in Israel in the fourth wave. So this is first thing to take into account. Why did we see the fourth wave anyway? First of all, because by the end of May 2021, we removed all restrictions. We thought we were over, out of the woods. And by June 15, even indoor masks mandate was canceled. And we went to pre-pandemic regulation. Um, so it was full susceptibility. The second reason was uh, because of Delta. And um, finally, um, I will say that um, the key thing that caused uh, uh, the fourth wave was the waning of the immunity from our vaccination campaign. Let's talk about it for a few minutes. What you see here in this graph, which is a little complex, so I'll go through it uh, slowly. And this is from a work done by researchers of the Ministry of Israeli Ministry of Health. What we see here is the rate of infection um, in different age groups. You can see 60 plus on the most right hand side. And you can see what was the rate of infection 
uh, in terms of people that were vaccinated in different points in time. And you can see here the people that were vaccinated earlier had more infections in the Delta wave than people who were vaccinated later in a dose response clear manner. So this is a good hint that vaccination effect has been waning. Not completely, but it has been waning. Uh, this is the same graph for severe illness. And you can also see more severe illness among uh, adjusting for age and, and other uh, uh, relevant factors. Um, uh, severe infection protection was also waning by time from vaccination. Now, um, what Israel has done in order to tackle the problem of waning immunity was to revaccinate, to provide booster doses. And you can see here how uh, uh, the rate of very rapid rate of providing the booster doses to uh, those who got their second dose. Overall, until now, this is fairly uh, recent data. It shows that over 50% of the eligible uh, 12 years and older individuals in Israel have already received their booster dose. And we still have uh, 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 another significant proportion that uh, are still protected um, and therefore do not require the third dose. So overall, we're doing well in terms of, of our booster vaccination. And when you look at the 60 and uh, uh, years and older population, then uh, you can see that 81% of uh, uh, this population has received already a booster dose. Now, this is the rate by which we have get provided the booster dose. And you can see most of the booster doses were provided early to the older population and then gradually to the younger population. The outcome of this, and you can see here the decline of the Delta wave, you can see that the decline began on the older population. This is age groups. So uh, in, in the lower here, in the lower part, you can see how the, the um, infection started receding first uh, among those who were older because they got their boosters first and how this gradually goes by age and how uh, the people who are younger than age of 20 actually had a higher peak during the Delta wave in terms of a number of infections than they did on the Alpha peak uh, on uh, January. This is uh, an earlier picture and this is a more recent picture that shows you how in all age groups by now, disease has been declining in the recent weeks. Now, to truly assess the booster dose vaccine effectiveness, and with this, I will soon conclude, um, Israel Ministry of Health has uh, uh, provided uh, uh, their assessment of this, which was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And you can see here the graph of vaccine effectiveness going higher as you go beyond the seventh day of the booster dose. Uh, there were some uh, uh, residual bias issues that they tried to explain here in this graph that show that they, uh, in the early days, you can still see effect of protection that is caused by bias, which is hopefully mostly gone by the second uh, part of the uh, uh, assessment. They have assessed the booster protection uh, versus two doses to be either 11-fold uh, uh, higher protection or from confirmed infection and almost 20-fold reduction uh, among uh, in severe illness among those who got their third dose. Um, so we at Clalit did the same uh, study design, very intricate study design uh, on uh, uh, with matched uh, individuals. It has not yet been published, so I will not be able to share too much uh, data on it. All I would say is that we have we we can now confirm that uh, vaccine effectiveness is very high, not as high as some of the estimates that I've shown you before, but above ninety percent. So uh, the vaccine is doing very well in preventing severe illness. Uh, in, in those vaccinated individuals with booster doses. You don't actually need complex studies to see that. This is basically this, the rates per 100,000 population of severe cases in Israel in recent weeks. And you can see the, the rates per population among those who got no vaccine, that's the light blue, one to two doses of vaccine, which means no booster dose, that's the green, and uh, three doses, booster dose in dark green. I think these figures speak for themselves, and um, this is enough uh, to, to explain where we're standing. So last point I will make is that we made recently an assessment of what was the overall impact, societal impact of uh, uh, th this Delta wave. And these are really sobering numbers. 
among all of those unvaccinated people above the age of, of 60, it's actually 60, not 65, above the age of 60, one in 70 individuals above the age of 60, unvaccinated, was hospitalized with severe illness during the Delta wave, especially in the last two months. And 40% 40 of those have died by now, of those who were severely ill. Even in the younger age group, 40 to 60, the toll was significant with one of every 250 approximately people hospitalized with severe illness, 70% of these have died. So this, these Khalid data are really sobering and these rates are much higher among those who uh, were unvaccinated than among those who got vaccinated in the past, even with the two doses. So I'll skip this for Regeneron and I will end with this slide that shows where we are today. It seems like the uh, 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 Delta wave is waning and we do hope that we will bear uh, some good news. I will tell you that our assessment is what we have gone through will be a replica in other countries that will more gradually meet this phenomenon of waning immunity as they graduate from the six months period from their key point in time in which they re reached 50% of the population vaccinated. And then, you know, six months later, they will might see a similar picture. And I'm afraid that many of them might see that in the coming winter, which would make things even more complex. And so here we are again in our midst, trying to uh, make sense of things. And I hope that I help demystify some of the issues at hand. These are the amazing group at the Khalid Research Institute and Khalid Innovation that have been able to provide you with all this data. And I wanna thank them all. Thank you.